Four signs that show we are walking in the Spirit. After giving your lives to Christ and accepting Him as our Lord and Savior, our Christian journey begins. A lot of people have the misconception that this is the end, but it really isn't. It's only the beginning of many spectacular changes that will take place in the time to come as we continue on this eternal path. As we grow in our journey with Christ as a believer, there are visible signs and changes that confirm our growth in Christ and tell whether we are on the right path or not. As a child, my father used to always tell me, growth is a principle. If something is not growing, there is a problem. I believe this to be absolutely true in the spiritual sense. Luke 2 verse 52 And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and men. Now in the Bible we see this wonderful term, walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 16 I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5 verse 25 If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. To walk by the Spirit, you first need to receive the Spirit. The Spirit we are talking about here is the Holy Spirit. He is the helper for Christians who want real results in their Christian walk. The Holy Spirit comes with a wonderful range of benefits to the believers. He gives us the power to overcome the challenges of life, to bear the greatest burdens and adversity. This is why you find saints who are filled with the Holy Spirit still have joy during the sorrows of life. He is also a guide. He will guide us into all truth. He knows the way Jesus opened when he was on earth. The way which leads you away from everything harmful and negative and towards what blesses and benefits your neighbor, filling you with joy and peace. Therefore, to live a life in the Spirit, a life that walks in the Spirit and not the flesh, is a life centered around the Holy Spirit. Here are four signs that show we are walking in the Spirit. Firstly, an individual begins to deliberately chase after Christ and the things of the Spirit. Growth is intentional, not accidental. Just as we are conscious about our physical growth, nurture our bodies and keep it healthy, this is also necessary when it concerns the Spirit. There has to be conscious effort of abiding in Christ, the determination to follow His commandments and do whatever He asks. 1 John 3 verse 24 now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. Chasing after Christ isn't necessarily about doing activities or being busy working for him, as many of us have termed it to mean. Although our service and willingness to do God's work or be an instrument in his service is also further confirmation that we love him, but that isn't all there is to it we need to make sure that we keep His commandments and maintain our connection through prayer, trust, and constant yielding and brokenness in spirit. It's not about working for Him, it's also about letting Him work in us too. Secondly, our gaze is not fixed on fleshly desires. The more we journey with God and walk in the Spirit, the more we see the desires to gratify the desires of flesh die and fade away. This isn't because of our own willpower, but because of the Spirit of God that's at work in us. Galatians 5, verse 16 to 17. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit likes what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so you are not to do whatever you want. Apostle Paul pointed out to us in this verse that it's not by our power that the natural man gives way to Christ, but by abiding and walking in the Spirit. When we find out that the mundane things that normally get us attracted, excited, or distracted no longer please us or tickle our fancy, it's a good sign that God's Spirit is mightily at work in us. When we no longer yield to the yearnings of the flesh and all our priorities are things that pertain to the knowledge of God, we can be said to be walking in the Spirit. Thirdly, yielding to the things of the Spirit comes easily to you. Walking in the Spirit makes keeping the laws and commandments of God easier. If at every point in our Christian journey we struggle to obey God's instructions, or find it difficult to follow God's lead, or struggle to surrender to God's will rather than our own, 
then it might be that we haven't surrendered to him fully and let him have his way in us. We won't dilly-dally, procrastinate, or wait to be dragged in before expressing our love for him if his spirit is at work in us. To walk in the spirit also makes us overcome all kinds of temptations that might appear in our lives. Even when our fellow humans tempt us and are incited to retaliate or react in very unpleasant ways, we hold our peace and resolve the situation amicably without escalating. Romans 12 verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This will be our anchor scripture whenever we are faced with situations that will ordinarily make us react in a retaliative or destructive way. Fourthly and finally, we are producing good fruits. The fruits we produce indicate whether we are truly walking in the Spirit or aren't just trying to keep up appearances. The book of Galatians 5 verse 19 through 26 clearly states the acts of the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 22 to 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law, and those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. When we see these fruits manifest in our lives and our default resolve to handle and approach any situation we are going through in life is calm, it shows that we are yielding and giving in to the work of Christ in us. As we continue to yield, these fruits become more pronounced in our lives. We will be continuously transformed so we think and act differently from who and what we used to be. As much as growth is intentional, it's also not a one-day job. Nobody grows into being an adult in one day. In our Christian journey, especially as young Christians, sometimes we might lose our way or digress from the path. We should not lose hope or courage or think God is no longer interested in us or our journey has become useless because of that one mistake or multiple mistakes. We should find the boldness and comfort we need in Christ and continue. Another name for the Spirit is the Comforter. He will comfort us, hold our hands, and lead us through the journey. We mustn't get to any point in our Christian journey when we think we are independent of the Spirit or are knowledgeable enough to walk our own walk. The walk with the Spirit is a perpetual one. We should continuously seek the Spirit's help to stay on track and get the strength needed to finish our course as a victor. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Romans 8 verse 26. The Holy Spirit plays a very important role in the new birth in a sense that it is Him who convicts us of sin and causes us to be born again and to give our lives to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the one who cleanses, renews our spirit, and transforms our hearts. John 3, 3 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus was telling Nicodemus and all of us that our whole life should be cleansed and our hearts transformed. That is to be born again. The Holy Spirit produces this new birth in our lives. Jesus was talking about your inward life, what you are. The term born again means to be born anew and to be born from above. In other words, the source of this new birth is God. Jesus is saying that you cannot experience the reign of God without experiencing the new birth first, or the supernatural birth. Nothing can cleanse the sin that is inherent in our heart. Jesus knew that Nicodemus needed more than a respectable teacher. 
He needed a savior. He needed more than religion. He needed regeneration. He needed more than law. He needed life. Jesus knew what lies deep in the heart of all people. The fatal disease that causes lying, cheating, hate, prejudice, greed, and lust. In salvation or new birth, the Holy Spirit is the cure of this disease called sin. Romans 8, 26, 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Romans 8, 38, 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Holy Spirit is given to the called out community as the teacher of all truth, the comforter for the troubled heart, the eternal guide for the sheep of God, and our superior intercessor. This does not exhaust the roles he plays in our lives, as he is the fulsome of all the church needs to operate in this world. He does not only aid the general congregation when she gathers for services. He is intrinsic to our lives as individuals and helps us on a personal level. It is the spirit in us individually who brings unity and causes the body to flourish as a community of love. Prayer is an essential discipline in our lives as Christians. Two notable authors have stated the essential value that prayer adds to our lives, and I would like you to contemplate their observations. Philip Yancey says, the main purpose of prayer is not to make life easier, nor to gain magical powers, but to know God. It is absolutely pointless for us to live as Christians without a desire or an aim to know God. This must be the singular motivation of all of us who name the name of Jesus Christ. Philippians 3.8 is a confession of desperation aimed at knowing God. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Whatever else we desire from life and in life, this must be our sole motivation in all our efforts. We need to see that knowing Jesus Christ as the highest seat we can attain. I beseech you to pray because this is how we get to know God. Prayer is the open admission that without Christ we can do nothing, and prayer is the turning away from ourselves to God in the confidence that He will provide the help we need. Prayer humbles us as needy and exalts God as wealthy. This is John Piper's observation of the role prayer plays in our lives. All that we do of worth is done through Jesus, and all we need for life and godliness are provided through Jesus. When we pray, we are turning to the supreme provider and the everlasting sustainer. How then can we live as Christians without prayer? We cannot. But the reality is that prayer does not come easy. We often find ourselves asleep like the disciples in the garden with Jesus. 
whether physically or spiritually, when we should be watching and praying, tragically, we fall asleep instead. Prayer is something that should be important to us as Christians. It should take priority in our lives. It is spending time with God. Is God important to you? If the answer is yes, then prayer should be as well. How often do you pray? Every day, approximately how long? Five minutes? Well, maybe seven. Do you sense the presence of God when you pray? One of the main reasons for this is that we have fallen asleep when it comes to prayer. We are weak. The great news I have for you is that the Holy Spirit is always there to help us to pray. He is indeed our always present help, and we do need the help of the Holy Spirit to pray. He helps us when we cannot, when we are weak in any area of our lives. We have the assurance of God's help. When we are weak in our prayer life, we have the benefit of the Holy Spirit who Paul says in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Weakness is a lack of power, but the Holy Spirit is the omnipotent God who is here to endue us with power so we can pray. He does not only help our powerlessness, but he also aids our ignorance. Paul continues, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. If we are honest, we would confess that we do not always discern the will of God concerning the world as it is. The Holy Spirit is in us, enlightening our minds so that we can pray rightly. He knows the heart of God, and He immutes the will of God into our minds. He dispels ignorance and introduces knowledge into our minds. This sounds exciting to me. This is what spirit ignited prayer sounds like. When we invite the Holy Spirit into our prayer lives, the fire will return. God will set his unquenchable fire in our hearts and minds if we do not quench his spirit. The beauty of the passage is that sometimes when the Holy Spirit is praying through us, he uses the faintest of sounds to express God's will through us. Then seemingly unintelligent utterances are used to echo the heart of God as the Holy Spirit brings the treasures that he has found from searching God's heart. The inner groaning of the saint's heart happens as the Holy Spirit intercedes per the will of God concerning us. This is truly amazing because God's heart is abundant in wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. We do not need to shy away from prayer or struggle to pray. All we must do is invite the Holy Spirit to return the excitement of prayer in our lives. We must live in a full assurance that God wants us to know Him, but we cannot know Him without prayer. So He ensures that the Helper who comes alongside us and who dwells in us will help us to pray. We must not be dismayed when we do not fully grasp all that pertains to our future. God is in control, and we are being prayed up by the Holy Spirit. One thing we know for sure is that we are forever joined to the love of God through His Spirit. Nothing can sever that love bond that the Holy Spirit has established. Paul declares this, neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Prayer is the love language that is forged between us and the Father. The Holy Spirit ensures that as we are yoked to God, as his redeemed the lines of communication will not become corroded. All we need to do is to invite him in. Are you weak? The Holy Spirit is your strength 
to keep on praying. Do you lack knowledge? The Holy Spirit is your provider of wisdom and truth from the heart of your God. John 14, 16 and 26. And I pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Do you have a special burden or request you want God to hear? Keep on praying. Trust your loving Heavenly Father to answer according to His wisdom and schedule. God honors persistent prayer. Signs your character is becoming more like Jesus. Becoming more like Jesus is the desire of every believer, and it should be your desire, as it should be my desire. The wonderful thing to know is that God has the same desire for us. Romans 8 verse 29 For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Our destination is Christ. There is no other person or creature that we are to take after other than Christ. Although Paul urged the believers in Corinth to imitate him, but he only ordered them to emulate him because he was a true follower of Christ. It is good for every believer to be able to measure the degree of their conformity to the image of Christ. Today, we shall be evaluating some of the signs that prove our character is becoming more like Jesus. We shall have to place ourselves on the scale of God's Word to determine how weighty we are on His balance. Here are three signs that your character is becoming more like Jesus. There are more signs than these, however. If truly you are conforming to the likeness of Christ, you will undoubtedly find these three in your life. Sign number one, holiness and great consciousness of sin. Romans 6 verses 1 to 4. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The Bible affirms that our baptism at salvation is a symbolism of our death, burial, and resurrection reality in Christ. We passed from death to life when we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Therefore, we are expected to walk in the newness of life. It is unfortunate that several so-called believers have taken the grace of God to mean that they can commit sin at will and obtain the mercy of God by applying the blood of Jesus. We cannot continue in sin and ask God to multiply His grace upon our lives. We should all understand that the grace of God is not for sinners, but for the believers. It is therefore impossible for us to receive grace as a right to sin willfully. True Christians are therefore not just churchgoers but those that have accepted the gospel of Christ and have turned away from their sinful ways. One of the fruits of our salvation 
is holy living. This is how we prove that we truly belong to Christ and that we are conforming to his image. Christ had no sin, but he carried our sins so that we can become the righteousness of God. 1 John 3 verses 3 to 9 He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Anyone that is born of God does not continue to live in sin, because the consciousness of God is heightened in him or her. If nothing pricks your heart any time you do something wrong or you sin against God, it is an indication that you are far from being like Christ. If we continue to sin after Christ has saved us, to what end are we saved then? If we continue to sin, what would we say Christ saved us from? The seed of God in believers' lives reminds them that they belong to a holy God and that they must live a holy life. One of the ways to know if you have a great consciousness of sin is that your conscience will be alive and active. Those that have deviated from the holy lifestyle of Christ have consciences that are dead. They are no longer conscious of sin. Such people do not have any sense of guilt and they will never show remorse for their sinful acts. If truly your character is becoming more like Christ, sin will become irritating to you, and your desire will be to please the Lord and to be righteous in all that you do. Once you are convicted in your conscience of a wrong deed, you will not find it hard to apologize to those you have wronged, and you will not hesitate to ask God for his mercy. God commands us to be holy as he is. Hebrews 12 verse 14 also urges all believers to follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man can see the Lord. Are you truly holy? Are you sure that your lifestyle is pleasing to God? Do you hide your sins when the Holy Spirit convicts you through your conscience? These are indications that you have not offered your body as a living sacrifice to the Lord. The second sign is humility. Philippians 2 verses 5 to 8 Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. One of the greatest attributes of Christ that every believer must emulate is humility. The Bible says that although Christ was being made in the same fashion as God, yet he never prided himself as God. Unlike the devil, who was filled with pride and thought in his heart of how to exalt his throne above the throne of God, Christ humbled himself, left his glory in heaven, and came to this dark world, not firstly as a judge, but as a sacrificial lamb for the sins of humanity. The Bible says that Christ stripped off his divine reputation and took on the form of a servant. He humbled himself and descended so low to the point that he despised the shame of dying on the cross. Humility should be the trademark of every believer. Our Lord was humble, and so we must be. He obeyed the will of his Father and modeled the life of true submission and absolute surrender to God to every believer. The Bible says that no man should think of himself more highly than he ought, 
Therefore, we must live humbly, irrespective of how greatly God has blessed us. How can a true child of God not possess the simple honesty to accept his wrong and repent before the Lord? Such arrogance usually leads to destruction. No matter the level of anointing you carry as a believer, you must not show off or usurp the glory of God. God will not share his glory with any man. Whatever you possess is given to you by God. And if you have received it, then you have to be humble and not oppress people with it. The Christ we are serving never oppressed anyone with the grace of God upon his life. Sign number three is the unfeigned love for God and humanity. John 15 verses 9 to 13. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another, as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. God loves us, and Christ loves us too. God demonstrated his love to us by sending Jesus to die for our sins, and Christ communicated his love to us by accepting God's will concerning his death. If we are truly becoming like Christ, we will find that something within us wants to reciprocate this divine love. Therefore, our love for God and for humanity is expected to be unfeigned and growing. Jesus summarized the whole law of Moses into two. We are to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our might, and we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. If Christ loves us so much that he died for our sins, then we have to love others the same way. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. If truly we are becoming like him, we ought to grow in our love for humanity. We prove our love to God by obeying his commands and also by creating quality time to fellowship with him. Our love towards humanity is proven through our relationship with people around us and our ability or willingness to preach the gospel to those that are perishing. It is amazing that quite a number of believers think that some people are good for hell. This they prove by holding the thought that such people do not need the gospel because they can never repent. Meanwhile, the greatest act of love that Christ showed to the world is the salvation he offered to humanity. And in the gospel, the greatest power of God is manifested. We are saved to save others, and we are saved to do good works. The works of Christ on earth are to be continued by believers. That is the reason we are not caught up to heaven the moment we gave our lives to Christ. Do you truly love God? If you claim to love him, how obedient are you to his instructions? Do you give him quality time in your life? What about the people around you? Are you truly demonstrating the love of Christ to them? If you truly love humanity like Christ, you will not hesitate to preach the gospel to the perishing souls around you. More so, your good works will prove that you love them. If these signs are wanting in your life, they are clear indications that you have not been conforming to the image of Christ. However, God is calling you to a changed life. You can become like Christ in all you do. Four warnings we need to stop ignoring. The Bible was written by people who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. 
Every single one of the scriptures we see in the Holy Bible are from the Holy Spirit. Within the Bible, we are told how we as children of God should live our lives. God has our best interests at his heart. He is only interested in your well-being and your eternal spirit. That is why the Bible does not sugarcoat or dance around particular subjects. Within the Bible, we are instructed on how we are to conduct ourselves as believers and how we should live our lives. This is why we should constantly read the Word of God and have knowledge of it, so that the Word of God along with the Holy Spirit can guide us through this life and into eternity. Let us begin. Have you ever felt like saying something really harsh, I mean something really hurtful to someone, in retaliation to what they said to you. But then, just when you feel the anger welling up in you and about to rush over and spill out in the form of meanness and vileness, something touches your soul and you pause to reconsider. We all have those moments when we want to defend ourselves with our strength because we feel cheated or shortchanged. But the Holy Spirit nudges us otherwise and tells us to hold ourselves back. In James' epistle, the Bible charges and shows us the perfect template for responding to issues and handling matters that might arise in our daily lives. The Holy Spirit is constantly guiding us on the will of the Father and how to best model our lives. There are always subtle warnings and signs He impresses on our spirits on how to effectively walk our journey of faith. Here are four of them. Warning number one, pride. James chapter four, verse six. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Every sin started from this point. Before humanity was created, this one sin created war in heaven. There is a popular saying, that pride goes before a fall. Even when a prideful person is approaching a pit and is on the brink of sinking deep, nobody would tell him because he wouldn't just listen. He would rather do what pleases him. God resists the proud and uplifts the humble. This resistance can be akin to the disposal of the devil and relegating him forever to condemnation. We should subject ourselves to God's will and forsake every haughtiness of heart that makes us always beam the searchlight on ourselves and not God. Pride is a sin because it makes us have a self-centered perspective rather than solely focusing on God. I honestly believe that this is one of the greatest warnings in the Bible, arguably the greatest warning. What James chapter 4 verse 6 tells us is there is something about the nature of pride that makes God directly oppose it. What a life. Imagine a life of having God against you. We should strive to humble so that we may have grace from the Lord God Almighty. God that he says that he is the enemy of pride. Psalm chapter 101 verse 5. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure, says the God of the universe. The Bible warns us about this sin, but are you going to listen? Hear the word of God just from the book of Proverbs. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look. God hates the sin of pride in a way, is the teaching of the inflatable scripture. Scripture continued to condemn the spirit of pride even in the New Testament. I wish to say is that pride is absent in the holiest character. Of course it is. God is against pride. Therefore, if a man is a godly man, he will be the least proud. Jesus was perfectly godly and therefore entirely lacking in pride. The ramification of pride are staggering. I have no statistics to back this, but I believe we would be surprised at the amount of marriages and relationships that end simply because of pride.
Pride kills relationships. It creates a wedge between two people destroying intimacy, eroding trust, and denying peace between husband and wife. Few things are as toxic to a relationship as pride. Two words, I'm sorry, won't come out of a pride person's mouth. The inability to apologize can appear for two reasons. First, a prideful person may not be able to see they are wrong. Second, a prideful person might not be willing to admit fault, even when they know it is theirs. Either way, the words I'm sorry are never heard, or if they are, they are quickly followed by, but you did this. Never taking time to look at their own faults. It's okay to be wrong. No one is perfect. Apologize and mean it. It doesn't make you any less of a man or woman for admitting a mistake. Rather than always point the finger, pride requires us to look better than others. A pride-filled person becomes an expert at finding faults in others. It's as though they have fault-finding glasses and once they view life through that lens, problems is all they see. They actually believe finding fault is their gift and they readily point out the fault of everyone. Bosses, co-workers, friends, political leaders, referees, coaches, and even their spouse. Now, here's the thrust of the whole message. Should I become proud as an individual, then God is against me. Just imagine the horror of living a life of God being against you. The most powerful king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, being against you. God hates this sin as we've seen in a particular way. Warning number two, anger. Whenever we are aroused to get angry and spit words that we would likely regret later, we should take a cue from Jesus on what he said about forgiveness. Seventy times seven times in a day. This isn't literally talking about forgiving someone seventy times seven times. But how idle could you be to keep a record of how many times someone gets on your nerve in a day? How annoying could they really get? They will definitely be offensive. People will always get on our nerves. That is inevitable. We can't decide or control that, but we can control how we would respond to these offenses. Anger is not a fruit of the spirit and of course shouldn't be a trait that abounds in the heart of a child of God. Ephesians gives us almost a chance to express our anger, but we should also let it vanish almost immediately. Ephesians chapter 26 verse 27 Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give a place to the devil. We are human, and anger is a human emotion, but don't sin in your anger. This simply means that every time we let anger thrive and linger in our hearts, we give the devil a loophole to penetrate and have a soft landing in our hearts. Don't ever make decisions in your anger. One decision made in anger can change the trajectory of your whole life. Warning number three, watch your speech. The mouth, though the smallest part of the body, is very powerful. The things we say with our mouth can either make or break us. They can either bless us or curse us. As believers, we are urged to bridle our tongue and be careful of the words that proceed out of our mouths. They carry power. The Bible makes us understand that there is the power of life and death in the tongue. We should always make positive confessions and not bring doom or setbacks into our lives because of our utterances. I hear a lot of children of God saying, That scared me to death. It's not a laughing matter. Don't say that. Or when a loved one says they are not feeling well and you reply, Oh, you poor thing. Why do you describe your loved one as something you wouldn't want them to be? I know all of these things appear small, 
But the Bible tells us clearly, our enemy the devil goes to and fro on the earth and walks up and down on it, looking for an opportunity to enter people's lives. Our enemy the devil does not fight fair and will use even something as small as that to enter our lives. We should be mindful of the things we say to people and the consequences of what we say to ourselves and about ourselves. Our word should always be befitting of a believer and a follower of Christ. The final warning we are going to look at given by the Holy Spirit in the Bible is Colossians chapter 4 verse 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how to answer every man. Also, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason, so that we can listen more and say less. We aren't supposed to react to everything insolence tossed at us, or be too excited to respond to a situation that we say inappropriate things. We should always take that one minute pause and listen to the guide of the Holy Spirit. James chapter 1 verse 19 advises us to be slow to speak and slow to wrath. The first reaction isn't always the best reaction. And the truth is one sentence has the ability to damage 20 years of a relationship. James chapter 1 verse 19 Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. The Holy Spirit is your comforter. You are never alone. In the early part of John 14, the disciples of Jesus were troubled when he told them he was going to leave them to prepare a place for them in heaven. The disciples were upset. Jesus was leaving them the one they had come to know as the Son of God, the one they worshipped, the one who took care of them, the one they looked to for guidance was leaving them, the one their whole life revolved around was leaving them. Oh, how they must have felt when the Son of God told them that he must go. You need to realize that Jesus was talking to a group of men who had followed him day and night for three years. They had seen his miracles. They had been protected by Jesus. They had been taught by him. Jesus had provided for them for three years. Any problem they had, they went to Jesus and he solved it for them. Their whole life literally revolved around Jesus. They had left their jobs, their lives, and even family members behind too, and now he was leaving them. But one of the most wonderful things about God is that he never takes away, he adds more. He never subtracts, but he adds. He never leaves you in distress, but he always comforts you. John chapter 14 verse 16 through 17. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may remain with you forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. He left, so that the Father will send the person of the Holy Spirit, Jesus highlighted to us that it is in our best interest that he leaves. John chapter 16 verse 7 Nevertheless I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. It is expedient for you that I go away. This had to be difficult for the disciples to believe. How on earth is it in the interest of the disciples that Jesus left? How on earth is it to the advantage of the disciples that Jesus left? It is expedient for you that I go away. From our perspective, these words of Jesus hardly seem like a good thing. 
Jesus not being here with me does not seem advantageous for me because I need Jesus in my life. I need the Savior in my life. I need the one who raises the dead and walks on water in my life. It was understandable that the disciples were confused as to how it is to their advantage that Jesus is going away. This is not by any means a negative thing. But as long as Jesus was there in person, the object of the disciples' faith would always be a tangible, external person, Jesus Christ. That is great still, but Jesus knew that the disciples would have to go out into the world and preach the gospel, and he would not be physically present with them all at the same time, but the Holy Spirit would. And even in the lives of believers today, Although Christ is not physically there with them, the Holy Spirit is. All across the world, in the furthest reaches of the globe, there are people, saints of God, who are indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God. All across the continent of Africa, you will find people like this. All across the continent of Europe, you will find people like this. All across North and South America, you will find people like this. People who are filled with the Holy Spirit. People in all walks of life who are filled with the Holy Spirit. Perhaps the reason why these words of Jesus do not encourage us is because we do not draw upon the power, life, and strength of the Holy Spirit. We cry out to Jesus saying, where are you? Yet fail to sense the presence and comfort of the Holy Spirit. If Jesus says that this is to our advantage, then he is right and our perspective must be wrong. If Jesus didn't leave, the Holy Spirit would not come. When Jesus was physically on earth, he was not omnipresent. But the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. He also knows all things and lives in all believers at the same time. Like the disciples of Jesus, many of us are getting weighed down because we think we are alone. We think God has left us. But the message of today says that the Holy Spirit is your comforter and that you are never alone. There is something great about the consciousness of the Holy Spirit will do to you. Understanding that He is ever right beside you in every situation gives you great peace which no word can express. Jesus promised to send another comforter when He leaves the world. That comforter is the Holy Spirit. Fortunately, we are not expecting the fulfillment of that promise like the disciples of Christ. We already have the reality of that promise. The Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, and ever since then, He has been in the world. Jesus told us in clear terms what the Holy Spirit will come to do when He finally comes. The word comforter in John chapter 14 verse 16 refers to the Holy Spirit, and the Amplified Version of the Bible gives us the full scope of the Comforter's ministry. As the Comforter, the Holy Spirit is also our counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, and standby. We cannot have all of these in the Holy Spirit and live as if we are alone. Have you ever wondered at the reason the early believers were tortured and imprisoned and yet they remained happy? It was because the Holy Spirit was their comforter. There wouldn't be a need for the comfort of the Holy Spirit if there was no distress in the world. Jesus never told us that there will be no difficult times in our lives, but he assures us of comfort through the Holy Spirit. No matter what you are passing through, the Holy Spirit is with you. He is strengthening you, fortifying you. Come with strength into your life. The greatest cause of tragedy for believers does not lie, first of all, in the fact that they are faced with challenges, 
but in the fact that we are almost unconscious of the fact that the Holy Spirit is with us in our worst times. Whatever storm of life you are going through right now, whether it is sickness, whether it is the death of a loved one, whether it is financially difficult, whether it is divorces, whether it is the fear of the future, I want you to remember in my favorite Bible verses. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 2, which reads, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. God never told us that we will not face challenges. However, we should be conscious of the fact that when the Holy Spirit is with us, we will not face the challenges alone. You are never alone. Live in that reality. You are never alone. Don't forget that in reality, you are never alone. When you cry yourself to sleep, God is with you. He is a God that loves you and cares for you in a way in which you will never be able to understand. The comfort which the Holy Spirit supplies to believers overwhelms the turbulences in the world. There is nothing more comforting than to know that the Holy Spirit is with you at all times, both in good times and in bad. The reason the challenges of life will never be able to overcome us is that the Holy Spirit is with us. But you and I need to make an active effort, an active endeavor to build a relationship with Him. You can build a relationship with Him, my friend. You can. If you see Him for who He really is, the Holy Spirit is not an it, but He is a person you see. Jesus never referred to Him as an it, he always said, He, Him. The Holy Spirit is a person. If you think of the Holy Spirit only as an essence, a power, or wind, you would not be able to develop a relationship with the wind, but you can develop a relationship with a person, one who will be with you in all situations. You see, having the Holy Spirit is like having Jesus with you. John chapter 14 verse 16 And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another comforter. You see, that word another in its original language means another of the same kind. How Jesus was there for the disciple is how the Holy Spirit is there for you. What storm are you going through today? You are not alone.